So I studied the biosphere as a whole, and this is a relatively new development. Um, most, most, most of my work concerns the land biosphere, but of course the ocean has a biosphere in it too. Um, the study of the biosphere on a global scale uh, is something that's relatively recent. The perspective, um, the, the new perspective that we have now only dates back to about the 1980s or so, um, when it had finally become clear that human activities were massively modifying um, ecosystems, um, and not just ecosystems, but indeed the composition of the of the atmosphere, and that the two things were interrelated. So, in the late nineteenth century, a Swedish chemist called Svante Arrhenius um, theorised that industrial activities involving fossil fuel burning must be putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and increasing its concentration. And he also theorized that this should be leading to global warming. And he even made a calculation about how large it would be. And the calculation is fairly close, actually, to modern calculations of this effect. But it couldn't be tested because there was no instrument that could measure CO2 concentration accurately enough um, to find out whether it was increasing or not. Um, and that, that actually had to wait until the 1950s uh, when Keeling invented a machine um, that could measure CO2 with high precision. And um, when, as soon as it had been set up for a couple of years, it had become very clear that CO2 was increasing. And of course, it's been continuing to do so ever since. So we had to wait half a century uh, for confirmation of Arrhenius' ideas about CO2. Um, and we had to wait even longer for confirmation of his ideas about global warming because climate is, of course, a very complex thing. Um, cl climate is not just changing uniformly from year to year. Um, climate, we know, is warming, but the signal, if we look back over the record, the signal is not really clear until about the 1980s. It's only about then that the signal appears from the noise. So now we know that Arrhenius was right. But a lot of other changes in our way of looking at the biosphere came with this because, of course, CO2 is fundamental to plant life. So plants depend on CO2. They take it up um, and um, decomposing microbes um, put it back. And the flux involved is enormous. So large, in fact, that any perturbation um, to that flow of carbon dioxide into ecosystems and back out again, any small perturbation would um, be of a similar magnitude to the amount that we're releasing by fossil fuel burning. So it has gradually become clear that there is an intense interaction between the biosphere and, and the atmosphere, and that there is something which we now call the car global carbon cycle, um, which is the exchange of CO2 um, between the atmosphere and the ocean and between the atmosphere and the land. Um, and that basically it is all one system. So with this new understanding of the biosphere, there was a considerable um, pressure to develop global models of how ecosystems work and how climate modifies ecosystems, how climate controls ecosystems, and how ecosystems then in turn influence the carbon cycle. It was also gradually becoming clear that ecosystems would have more direct effects on climate because most of the water that comes into the atmosphere over the land surfaces is actually coming through plants. And so any change in the nature of the vegetation cover can influence the water exchanges, and it can also influence other physical properties like the heat absorption. And so, so we had a new notion of the biosphere as a highly interactive component of the Earth system. And what we didn't have was really the science um, required to um, develop numerical models. We had a science of ecology, but it was all about small-scale processes, much more about trophic interactions, much more about species than about physical processes and physical exchanges. So the theory had to develop pretty quickly. So we have Earth system models, which are climate models, basically, but they, which are originally derived from weather forecasting models, but adapted to a longer time perspective, but these models now actually incorporate um, models of the biosphere. So that seems like quite an achievement, but there are, are a few problems. And one of the problems is that when they're asked to um, make projections into the future under various scenarios, they all give different answers. 
and I guess they can't all be right. There are also some quite large biases. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's, that needs to be done, and the models are getting more and more complex at the moment, but they're not really actually getting better. And so what has now been realized by, by many scientists in the field is that we do need to do better. Um, in a way, we did this in too much of a hurry with hindsight. Um, so models have been developed um, independently by different groups without much um, cross-checking, um, without enough comparisons with data. A data here are a key issue because when we first started to work on these models, there were very few data of the large-scale kind that we would need to test all of our assumptions. The situation now has changed radically and is very much for the better. So not only do we have the highly precise measurements of carbon dioxide and other constituents of the atmosphere, um, but also um, we have um, measurements, um, local scale measurements of the flux of CO2 and energy between the, between the ecosystems and the atmosphere um, at several hundred sites across the world. Um, and we have um, physiological measurements at the plant level, um, which is of course small scale, but it becomes large scale when you have thousands of measurements made by different groups that have been compiled into databases. And then finally, we have the tremendous resource of data from satellites, which are now of course just those that are continuing are just giving us longer and longer records, but also um, records that are getting more um, precise and have more and more properties of the land surface, um, such as its greenness, which is obviously fundamental um, because the green color is chlorophyll, and that's what does photosynthesis, that's what takes up CO2, um, and also other properties such as the reflectivity um, of the land surface, and even now um, indicators of um, important quantities such as the light use efficiency of photosynthesis remarkably can actually be measured from space.